Well, my goodness, it, it truly, I, I told BJ, it's such an honor to be able to just share, share a little bit of, of my life. You know, got to meet BJ quite a few years ago. You know, our girls are about the same age. They're like a year apart. They were such, you know, dear friends. They, they're still friends today. And I just want to give you guys a little bit of a, a glimpse into to my life, my, my story. You know, I've been a disciple 23 years. Um, and my life changed a few years ago. So I wanted to share a presentation. I work in the school sometimes, you know, we get to do these little things. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So BJ is telling me that um, you guys are learning about devotion right now. And my particular thing that I get to share tonight is being devoted even through illness. And I think, you know, we're going to do a prayer and, um, and breathe. And thank you, Ariana, for praying for us. That being said, though, I do want to share with you guys a cool little tip that I learned. Um, so if maybe somebody can volunteer to be my timekeeper and 20 minutes into this, um, I would like somebody to just raise their hand and say, okay, pause. And, and I want to share something that I want you guys to take away, something I learned in a conference. So one thing that I want to start off with for me personally first is if um, somebody can volunteer to read this. Let me see here. I'm going to go ahead and put this up. I don't know if you girls can see this, but Luke 8 verse 43. Can somebody volunteer to read this? You can just unmute yourself. Thank you, Loretta. Did you, un oh, did you just take the video off or were you volunteering to read it? Here, I'll read it in case they're, you, all, they're all muted. Oh. oh, that's right, go ahead. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Perfect, thank you. I think, oopsie. Um, I want to go ahead and from the Passion Translation, I've been reading everything now recently through the Passion Translation. It just gives me just a different little glimpse. And so almost like I'm rereading the Bible. Um, in the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered greatly for 12 years from slow bleeding. Even though she had spent all that she had on healers, she was still suffering. Pressing through the crowd, she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing for a second. Better if you pick him up, or he just takes a. Oops, sorry. Uh, That's okay. And so for me, I feel like the woman's response. You know, she'd been sick, and I, I can't imagine not only being that sick for that long, but. I think when during that time it was the shame associated with, you know, with being, you know, when you're bleeding, you were not being able to be part of your community, you had to be separate. And yet during that time, after so much, okay, like this is, I mean, 12 years, this is pretty much something I have to live with, I guess. She didn't give up. She didn't give up. She still went after Jesus. She still got out of her comfort zone, you know, went through the crowd and her faith of just touching him. So, so for me, <laughs> I want to go ahead and I want to share a little bit of what, what I experienced. And I think that it's really important for me to share my, my reaction as well. Um, 2019, September, 2019, um, after a routine mammogram, the, the mammogram was done the day before my birthday and they saw something, they saw something, and they're like, eh, this seems kind of interesting. We need to do an ultrasound, did an ultrasound. They were like, we need to biopsy this immediately, biopsied it. And I've had so many biopsies over so many years. I've had so many problems where they're like, this cyst looks wrong, this cyst looks wrong. And I'm like, oh, here we go again, you know? But nothing prepared me for this. Um, and they ended up asking me to come back for a second uh, mammogram. And they asked me to bring my film from the one from 2018, which I had done at the Veterans Hospital. Come to find out, I had a tumor 
that the VA had said, oh, don't worry, just keep a look at it, they had doubled in size. And I ended up getting a call a month later um, because it took a process of me going back and all this. And I was at work and they said, they called me to say, hey, you need to come back. We're going to have to do, you know, further testing, but um, your, your tumor is cancerous. You, you have cancer and you're going to have to go through um, me, you know, you're going to have to come back for more testing or we're going to have to schedule. And I was like, what? in the world. Um, I think one of the things that, that I, I had to, I had to really battle because I had to make a decision that was on a Thursday and I had to make a decision. How am I going to, how am I going to react? I mean, my husband wanted me to come home and I stayed at work. There was a young man that, that was going to need my help. He was going to be at the bus stop waiting. He was going to catch the bus by the first time by himself and I was going to go with him. And I chose, I chose to go to church that Sunday, knowing that I didn't know anything. I didn't know any answers. I didn't know what level. I didn't know anything. And just the thought, I think the initial thought, my instinct was to just crawl, crawl in bed. And like, I just don't even want to see anybody, don't want to do anything. And I think trusting and going to church that day for the first time, the first time this one woman was um, visiting I had never met her before and she just came up to me. I was like, God was like, here, you know what? I'm going to put you at ease for a second. And I started talking to this older woman and um, she just held my hand. She goes, you look a little sad. And I said, oh, I just got some pretty intense news this week. I don't even know her. And, um, and so I said, oh, you know, tell me a little about yourself. She told me that she had come from China, medical doctor, come from China to USC, my alma mater, to study about research on cancer. And I couldn't believe it, it's specifically breast cancer. And so her and I ended up becoming really good friends. She ended up studying the Bible and she helped me so much through my journey. And I sit there and I think about, you know, just the thought of, making a decision to, to say, you know what, I'm going to deny myself. I'm still going to go after Jesus. And something that, that was mind blowing for me, I felt, you know, her name is Dr. Fu. When Dr. Fu said to me, wow, you know, so I, I shared with her, like, I just received this diagnosis and she was so positive. And she said, you have God, you can trust that God is going to take care of you. So to her, it was like, no duh, like what's wrong? Like, don't worry, like you're gonna be fine. And um, and I really, I really felt at peace with with just hearing her and just knowing that when we sit there, like for me, I could have I had an excuse, I had a valid excuse, I think, in my mind, to just just escape, like let me escape reality. I don't want to deal with this right now. So we're gonna continue sharing my screen. And One thing that, that I sometimes think about is, you know, when we think of ourselves going through, through sickness or, or getting a diagnosis, battling with so many things that have been going on. You know, I, I was, again, in the, the Passion Translation, looking at Matthew 26, and when Jesus described what he felt, you know, he was praying at Gethsemane. My heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then he walked a short distance away and overcome with grief. He threw himself face down on the ground and prayed, you know, my father, if there's any way you can deliver me from this suffering, please take it from me. And yet what I want is not important for I only desire to fulfill your plan for me. And then an angel of heaven appeared to strengthen him. I feel that when I allowed, when I allowed myself to really give this up to God, to, to let him know that I was going to trust him, I'm going to surrender. And I, and I truly wanted to imitate Jesus and say, okay, I just want to let me 
live out your plan for me. Let me trust that you're in control. And yes, of course, I wanted to be delivered from the suffering. And I went on faith. I went on faith and I remember every woman that I had met that was had been diagnosed before me that had had to go through chemo, had to go through radiation. And you guys, and BJ can attest, this is not, I'm proud, but I'm a very vain person and I had, my hair was my glory. I had hair all the way down to my, <laughs> my waist. And, um, and I, I donated my hair before I even knew if I'm going to go through chemo. I just want to donate. And I wanted to say, you know, God, I'm going to go in faith that I don't want to go through chemo. But if that's what I need to do to be able to, to relate, amen. And I went on faith and I did not have to go through chemo. I did not have to go through radiation. And I gave God my word, you know, that I felt that I trusted him all of this was going to happen. It was going to happen for a reason. I didn't know what the reason was. I didn't know what his plan for me was. But one thing that I continue to do throughout, throughout, after every single surgery procedure that I went through, I didn't ever, I didn't ever use any of the discomfort, my limitations, to not be able to meet with people, to be able to help people, to be able to stop meeting with the body. And I feel like the more that I denied myself, the more that God would just like completely, I wish I could show a video, completely beyond my wildest expectations, answer my prayer one time, my second surgery, I sat there and I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to take pain meds because my one of my family members ended up getting addicted to pain meds during two huge surgeries. And, and I begged God to just like allow me to have this pain taken away. I want to be able to get up and be alert and, you know, be present. And that night I was tossing and turning it was so painful. But the next day, all of a sudden, like what? I honestly truly felt no pain. And I'm like, this is, this is incredible. And I went in and I had to share that with the doctor, with the nurse. And, you know, I was able to, you know, go to church. I was able to meet with people. And then when COVID happened, you know, oh, I could do on Zoom. Yay. I didn't have to like get up and go. And, and, and I was still able to give. But I believe that, that even when I was going through, like I said, completely like cut open, tubes hanging out. God was so good. I I can't even describe, I think one time my mother-in-law didn't believe me, like how can you not be in pain? And I had to take a video and send it to her and then she was like, this is old video. And I said, okay, FaceTime so that she could see me, see me smiling, see me joyful and still be there for, you know, for every activity. So let me move on. I um, shared my response and I gave you a glimpse of my my little story. Um, one of the things that that I notice, and this is this is harder for me to do, if it's somebody else, and and some of us that may have never before I experienced an illness, to this grave of an illness, I think it's harder if it's our own children that are going through illness, you know, and do we allow? ourselves to imitate Jesus where he actually took the time first of all to take it to his father to pray about it instead of hey I'm just going to retreat I'm going to be by myself I just you know I'm going to put a wall up and not let anybody you know come in I think that that when that happens and I've been tempted to do that sometimes and I remember one time, one medication that I was in, it completely, and I mean completely knocked me out to I physically couldn't get up. I was in such a, I don't know how to describe it, except the depressed state that um, it, it was just the, the chemical that was in it. It was just horrible to me. But that's when Satan will take over our mindset. Nobody cares. You know, I don't have anything to give. Look at me. I'm probably just going to die anyways. And I mean, like all, all this stuff can just completely... 
I think that that I I know that there's times like the very first time that I went to service and, and a little cute young boy and BJ knows how much I, I work with kids. I work with special needs kids, but kids are my passion. And I'm always volunteering for children's ministry. And this little guy, especially little guys, I just love my little guys. And this one little guy, Miss Rosa, like running up and he went, and I was like, <gasps> like, holy cow. I just like, I have stitches in, you know? And I could have easily, that would have been a great excuse for me to say, you know what? Why are you coming here? Like, you're still healing, you could get hurt. There's so many reasons I could have easily used. But in that moment in time, that little guy was going through so much, his parents were about to get divorced and he needed to be able to talk, he needed to be. So I think that sometimes we have to believe, like truly believe, okay, God has a plan for me. Just Despite what I'm going through, whether for me it was a physical illness, for for some of us, you know, it could be mental illness, but there's so many things sometimes that can overwhelm us and we could easily justify pulling away, pulling away from not wanting to do something, not wanting to answer a phone call, not wanting to initiate a call, return a text, be there, you know, for each other. And yet I feel that if I am able to wake up <laughs> and I have the breath and the strength that I can show my love for God by being able to be there and give back. I truly believe that he does. If I'm alive, he has a purpose for me and I can't squander that. You know, I could sit there. My brother's gone to Iraq a few times. He just retired from the military. And, and he was explaining to me, like, you know what you do when you guys with the women meet with the other women? They can't do that. Women can't do that. You know, you'll get thrown in jail, get beaten, probably get killed. And, and every time he would share stories of what he witnessed, I just sit there and think, oh, my goodness, you're right. You know, this is something that I cannot take for granted. Um, if you guys have been studying out devotion, I wanted to bring the definition and I wanted us to consider this. Devotion is, you know, love, loyalty, enthusiasm. It could be for a person, for an activity, or for a cause. And I sit there and I think about, you know, in my last, my goodness, my last, sheesh, so 32 years married. It'll be 33 in May. I'm devoted to my husband, no doubt about it. That's the person. Am I more devoted than the person, Jesus? I love my husband. I love my child. I enjoy my job. I mean, I'm super enthusiastic about my job, about meeting people, about helping. Um, I. Am I having that type of enthusiasm for God, for his word, for his people, for activities, you know, having to do like, am I super excited when we're going to go and serve the homeless, you know, instead of church, that's our church service every last weekend of the month. Am I as enthusiastic about, enthusiastic about that as a trip to Cabo? You know, I mean, get real because devotion to a cause, hmm, you know, sometimes we can get into causes that are worldly, that are important, you know, but are we more devoted to a cause than we are for, I mean, Matthew 28, my purpose, you know, I sit there and I think about the loyalty my goodness, I, the, the loyalty that I, that I have for my profession, you know, like being ethical and doing this, but what about my loyalty to my group and knowing how much it means when we get together, when we do activities, my goodness, to be able to, when somebody has a baby, when somebody has COVID, when they're sick, am I sitting there and just think about myself? I think, um, I think of all the people <laughs> that 
every single day sent me a scripture from the minute I found out until the first surgery. I think about all the meals that I received, the encouragement, the cards, the prayers, you know, and that, that type of love that I felt, I feel like I'll never be able to <laughs> have enough time to, to repay that. I'm so grateful for that. And I sit there and I think that, that our church as a whole, I have experienced so much love. You know, BJ will, I, I don't know if you remember BJ, when my sister was 37 years old and had a heart attack and died. And my small group, we were part of a military group and so many people were living paycheck to paycheck. And yet they all pitched in and gave me this huge check to help pay for her for her service. You know, she was suffering. She was suffering from mental illness and it was tough, you know? And I sit there and I, just the devotion of that, I'll, I'll never forget. Like there have been times that I have shown my devotion to other things. For my daughter when she was young, there was a period that we were so much more devoted. I was so much more devoted on PTA and soccer and Girl Scouts. I kind of, Hey, this is, I'm, I'm showing this is more important than God. This is more important than anything else. And yet, you know, I think sometimes I feel personally that God allowed me to go through this. It puts, puts things in perspectives, puts my priorities. I sit there and think about what's important to me now. It's very different. And I feel like more than ever, I want to, I want to be able to be as close, as close to God. I love him more for sure. I'm so grateful that, that he allowed me to live. Whereas sometimes other people have not had that opportunity. It's like, wow, thank you. Like, God, I don't deserve this, but thank you. And I, and I want to be, I think how I'm going to show my love is truly 100% making everything jesus his activities you know the cause my priority i sit there and i think about for me personally what prevents me from being devoted what has prevented me from being devoted um and for me personally it's fear um i've been doing very good the healthiest that i've been since you know since all this happened and then i have a little a little slide, <laughs> a little slide back. And, um, and I got really sick in November. I got really sick in December with the flu. And then I got really sick in January with bronchitis. I'm like, what's going on? They did my blood work and, um, my immune system was back to being super, super low. And one thing that immediately, oh my goodness, you know, should I go and meet? We're meeting outdoors, you know, with masks. And I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision. And I think it's, um, I had to go on faith of, you know, I can choose to play it safe, do nothing, and just, you know, hide it at home. Or I can choose to go out and go on faith and still be wise and be careful. I think one thing that I have made a commitment. This is something that, that, that I made a commitment over the years. This is my personal conviction. If I can go to work, I'm going to go to church. I'm not going to sit there and be like, you know what? Well, I am so scared. What if I get sick or what if this? And I'm not going to go. You guys are going to meet, you know, indoors, but I'm going indoors to a classroom. Hmm. So that's my personal conviction that I have to ask myself. I'm not willing to be more devoted. And, and I'm technically, I'm retired for a year and a half and I'm just helping out. I'm semi-retired. I'm helping out as other therapists have babies. I'll cover for them part-time here and there. But I had to sit there and say, I will never, God, I won't give more to my job. And I love my job. I love my kiddos. I won't give more to them. Than to God's work. I refuse to. And I and I also think that, you know, during times like this, I didn't like technology. 
but I'm like, wow, God, like during the toughest surgeries that I had to have, like I was still able to, to meet, I can go on Zoom, I can meet people on Zoom, I studied the Bible on Zoom, like I love Zoom now, I hated Zoom. And I have to say, I was never aware of things like my, my, my smile, I have Invisalign now, thanks to Zoom because I'm so aware. <laughs> but I think that, that one thing that I have learned that anything that's going to get me out of my comfort zone, it's going to be for good. It's going to be, I mean, to help me, to stretch me out. And even though I didn't want to initially do even Zoom for work, I learned how to do it. I figured out how to make it happen. And then I'm going to, of course, do it for, you know, to participate in, in any activity, you know, in the kingdom as well. I think um, I for sure, I can't wait to hear, I, I want to hear everybody's takeaways and, and curious as far as what your, your guys's um, stories. For me, I think a long time ago, there was a man named Jay. Hess, Lisa's husband, and he was, he had cancer, and he didn't get diagnosed until late, and he knew he was dying. His last summer, he had oxygen, carrying a little oxygen tank, and yet he was like, I just want to serve. Big old smile, him and I were walking around you know, door to door, signing people up for healthy families. And I was so convicted by that to know, like, he has a choice of his last months here on earth. And how does he want to do it? He wants to be joyful, He's not mad at God. He wants to be able to imitate Jesus and serve. And I'm, you guys, I'm like a tiny little five foot nothing. You know, and he was, gosh, he was so tall. I don't know if you remember, like six foot something and big old beard. So him and I, you know, made the interesting pair, you know, walking around. I was his interpreter. and But I will never forget that. Never forget that kind of devotion that he had despite his illness, even despite knowing what little time he had left on here. To me, um... I took that and I wanted to imitate him. It was somebody that I definitely had a lot of respect for. So I'm curious if you guys have stories, if you guys have questions, if you guys have anything that maybe you've struggled with in your past. Like I said, for, for me, it was easier for me to deal with my own illness, I think, than maybe even dealing with an illness of somebody that I care for, like my own child or my mom with Alzheimer's or something like that. So. That is what I have to share. Did somebody have a 20 minute time slot? Because I wanted to do that first before we um, we move on. We'll consider it 20 minutes now. <laughs> perfect, 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 perfect. So um, one of the things that I learned a long time ago is after we're on a computer or reading or anything where we're, our eyes are focusing near point, um, our eyes will get strained. So I've learned this at a conference by an optometrist that he said after 20 minutes, you should close your eyes for 20 seconds. And that's when your eyes are completely relaxed because they're a muscle. And when they're focusing near point, they're like this all scrunched up. So they only relax. He said the way God made us was they're relaxed when you're looking over yonder 20 feet. We can't look out 20 feet. So I wanted to take a time and just take some beautiful breaths and I wanna, I'm gonna put the timer on so you guys know that I'm not making this up. It's just 20 seconds. I really want us to, 20, oops, wait, where am I? 20 seconds. When you hear the little timer, then you can open your eyes. Ready? Close your eyes and just take some deep breaths in. Okay, you guys, be honest. We live, open your eyes, we live in such a fast-paced world. Raise your hand, please. 
if you felt that that was longer than 20 seconds. That was 20 seconds. But yet just taking the time to be present, to breathe, and close our eyes for 20 seconds, it felt the first time I did it, I was like, there's no way that was 20 seconds, you know? But, but that's all it takes sometimes is 20 seconds just to, to breathe and do that. I did want to show, I wanted to show a picture of what my husband gave me so that I can take the time to breathe and do that. He actually created a meditation room in our spare bedroom. And I, um, I use it for, for, for meditation, to breathe. Sometimes I put the nature sounds of just the birds singing and I sit there and I remind myself that, you know, God cares more about those little birds and he cares so much more about me. And, and sometimes I just need that, that little reminder of if the windows are all closed and I'll, I'll put the little nature sound CD and do that. So thank you so much. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Rosa, you are beautiful. And guys, as you can see, this is why I keep my friends close by. She, she makes me slow down. She makes me breathe. She makes me take my time. And you know, I love Fidel to death. Oh, he loves the, you too. And so does my girl. <laughs> the fact that he would create that meditation room just for you, you know. That was so, my Christmas gift. Yeah, yeah. that's for Dell. Guys, I want everybody, to, I'm stalling so that you can get your thoughts together because I'm about to open it up in a moment. We want to hear from you. If you have questions, it's, it's that time to ask it. If you want to just share your story, like Rosa said, she'd like to hear that too. But God has put us in this together. You know, so often we are going through these things, but we're going through it alone unnecessarily. And they're difficult enough as is. Why shoulder it all by yourself? So if you have a a question or if you have a, uh, an opportunity to share something or you want to just go ahead and raise your hand first of all so not everyone's unmuting at the same time and I'm going to try to catch it if I can um let me see this is where it's hard because you can't quite see everybody you know what let me go into gallery view that will help oh yeah that's what I ended up doing that will help all right so if anyone wants to share if you can pop your hand up Carolyn unmute yourself Um, I just wanted to say, Rosa, that I'm really encouraged by your heart for God and your devotion through all of that, because I am definitely someone who really just my default is to want to hide. Yeah. Um, and it's been like that for a long time. And the way that we were raised was to be at church no matter what <clears throat> but i didn't <clears throat> i didn't learn how to have that desire of devotion it was more out of obligation and so i guess i'm just right now i'm really encouraged that there is it is a reality to be so devoted that even in the midst of pain and things that would probably keep most people from serving and having an open heart um, that you just carried on and had that love for your for your savior and your church and um, I really have been so encouraged and I pray, I pray constantly that I will keep my heart open um, and seek, seek that kind of devotion where I want to be with the church because of love and not out of obligation um, and feeling guilty. So I really appreciate you sharing. And I encourage you, I think that for me, Sometimes, you know, there were times that um, 
I, like I said, even when the times that I was afraid or my husband, he's super protective. And one time he was like my little bodyguard. He's, he's already the deacon of security at church. But he was my bodyguard. He's like standing in front. He's like, they're going to hurt you. They're going to do this, you know? And he, um, he's the one that, why, why my wife, why this? He was so mad at God. And he went through all that. I didn't go through that. And, and I think that, that every single time I just had to remind him like, oh my gosh, I was so inspired by someone. So I was so encouraged by something. So it, it always ended up, you know, um, me being encouraged by sometimes I may have made or encouraged someone, inspired someone, but a lot of the times I gained something from, from being there. And, um, at no point, at no point did I feel I had to, or nothing like that. Right. Um, I think I wanted to, I, I got so much from all the people from their true, genuine, I've been praying for you. I'm so happy to see you. That that just meant the world to me. So I, I don't think anybody has ever, on the contrary, they're like, you're here, you know, like I wasn't expecting you to be here. And so I never, I never experienced that part. Awesome. Thank you, Rosa. You're welcome. Linda, unmute yourself. Um, so, you know, the thing that's really resonated with me is the the devotion just to even no matter how you're feeling your devotion to god and to the body and i think we've lost a lot of that actually in the beginning was we just had that because that's what we were was expected to be done but having the heart to say you know what i'm just gonna step out i'm just gonna do this because you know, God is with me. And the more we focused on and are devoted to other people and other things, the less we're focused on ourselves. Because <laughs> it's easy enough to go, oh, I don't feel good. <laughs> like, so that, that actually was re really encouraging for me because and we all have busy lives. But you know, there are things just more important. I think it just depends, you know, it's where our focus is it, it chooses it's really what we choose to be devoted to, honestly. And I, yeah. so I really appreciate what you shared that's my that's my thinking thank you <laughs> thanks linda anyone else jen mary denny's sister <laughs> she put in the chat room i wanted to share that i'm very thankful for this group and the true honesty uh, that i've experienced in this short time i grew up very strict and to get over it. Uh, I grew up very strict and to get over it, but Mary really has helped me grow. So she said, and I'm not giving up and turn my back on God wow. again. Amen. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that. And Mary, thank you for being a great example for her to, to find her way. That's what we're here for. Uh, anyone else, anything you wanna share? Any questions or Ariana? I think um, first, just thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I think especially, I think the one of the parts that really resonated with me, like when you said it, I was immediately like, yep, that's my battle every time is when something happens, right? I'm grateful I've, I haven't had to struggle with um, long-term illness or anything serious like that. But I think the issue for like, it's it's that same issue with vulnerability whenever something happens and I'm am I going to just like crawl away and hide how I'm feeling or what I'm going through. Am I going to let people in? Am I going to talk about it in a way that's not just like describing how I'm feeling, but allowing people to see those feelings, like the way that they really are in all of their rawness, rather than feeling like I need to like put myself together before I'm like presentable or before I can present those feelings. And I think it just was really encouraging, I think, even to share, not even just to see your vulnerability tonight, but to hear you share about how you had to choose that. And I'm sure you didn't, it wasn't just the one time you had to choose it. You had to constantly <laughs> yeah. choose to let people into that process. <laughs> and, and I think, I think for me, you know, um, since I was very young, my mom became a single mom of four kids and I was 11 years old. So I was used to being independent and doing everything. And I don't like to ask other people. I don't like to depend. And um, and even like after my first surgery, I was not allowed to like lift up my arm because I had a double mastectomy. And um, and after 
like after a couple of weeks, I was like, I'm done. I need to just get my own, you know, water or whatever. Maybe it was after a few weeks. And so um, I ended up not following the doctor's orders because of pride of all these sisters were offering to come and, and help. I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. My husband's here, my daughter's here. Ah, I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. And then one time my husband had to go somewhere and I literally, I went, oh, and I ripped open my, um, my, my, my stitches and I had to have emergency surgery. And, um, and I had to learn, like, it's okay to invite people and it's okay to have, you know, somebody help me. And, um, I think it was, I think it was, it was very, um, it was very humbling too, you know, um, like I said before, I'm very, very vain person. That's my reality. I'm, I'm being honest with you guys. I know it's being recorded, but, but, um, you know, to sit there and have, you know, like scars just here and now here and all this stuff. And, um, it was really hard, you know, it was really hard, but I had to learn to say, it's okay. Yes. Okay. You want to bring meals? Yes. Thank Cause at first I was like, Nope, don't need anything. Don't, I have stuff in the fridge. I have everything prepared. I, you know, and I think sometimes, um, we're, we're, when we're prideful, we can kind of get a little humbled and go, it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to invite fellowship to, to your house. How many times have you done this? And so, um, I learned a lot. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And Lucy's nodding. Yes. She's, she's messing with me. Thank you, Lucy. I got the message. Uh, Christy. <laughs> got to unmute yourself. So trying to figure it out on my phone there. Um, I a lot resonated with me as well. Um, as some people on know that I went through um, being very ill from a liver condition and then had to have a liver transplant a little over a year ago. Um, but one of the things that really resonated was even being very sick and going into the hospital and being in there. And it was during COVID. Um, so I didn't really have visitors, but I just looked at it as an opportunity to, I don't know, connect with the people there caring for me. Um, they were, you know, lots of lab techs and, and nurses and um, even the people bringing dinner or, or breakfast um, just really taking that couple of minutes to get to know them in a small way, but maybe I would see them again, or they would share about their daughter in Reno or wherever, you know, and, um, and then I would pray for them, you know, and um, just trying to be a light, even though I was very sick and, and couldn't, you know, do very much. I, I really needed them. Um, but it just gave me joy to be able to see them, through Jesus's eyes and that's what I think of what when you were sharing you know just really going into church and in whatever way you could serve that way and just loving like Jesus um, having his cause um, and his activities to to love that way um, and then even now just being inspired to as I deal with you know I've, I've made it a year but you know things are a little bit hard because, you know, there's immune suppression medication and there's side effects and there's things to overcome. And oh, yes, yeah. still, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, which will be probably forever, you know, but really seeing how can I serve still, you know, how can I love like Jesus? It just, maybe it's in a different way or maybe it's not what I did, you know, 20 years ago but it's still, it's still God working through me. And, and what you said about, he has a plan for me, you know, he's not done. He has a plan. And just looking at that with excitement of where he's taking me. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I think every one of us, you know, we all have gifts, right? And I think, I think, like I shared with you guys, my gift, my gift is kids. I know kids. I know special needs kids. I know IEPs. That's one thing I know. So, so if I can give back to anybody, anybody that, you know, a young couple that no longer comes to church, you know, they were teen, 
kingdom kids and now they have a kid with special needs, I'm going to give back to them. Can you be part of my meeting? I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what this is. Can you join? It's via Zoom. Of course, I'm going to take that time off from work and serve. So we all have whatever way we can. It does not have to be, hey, I'm going to just show up to church. Because showing up to church, and if your heart's not even there because you felt that you, I have to go, I don't, that God knows our heart. You know, like if you give and you give with a bad heart, if you give by going, but your, your heart's not there, God knows that. So you have to pray about like, how can God use you? Something that you, that's genuine, that you truly believe. Like, I, I want to be here. I want to do this for anybody. And the Bible says to God's people first. So I'm going to give back to anybody first, obviously, my group of people. And it doesn't matter if they come to church or not. I'm going to give back in things that I know that I have a gift. Don't ask me about fixing cars nothing <laughs> don't ask my husband about that you know i know my limitations and i know my gifts and I, and i pray that every one of you literally just beg god to to reveal for you to feel so confident that you each have a beautiful gift and for you to share that beautiful or singing singing i'm not i'm not a singer either <laughs> <laughs> you are in the shower <laughs> All right, here's a question from Ashley in the chat room. It says, one of my biggest struggles is mental health and I can feel afraid to come to church when I feel like I don't have anything to give. Um, what helped you to still come to church activities when you felt limited in how much you could give being more of a receiver in those times? Accepting that, that's what I shared earlier, accepting that, that sometimes God's plan for me is to be encouraged, to trust in him, to, to know that maybe right now physically I can't give, or during those times where I was telling you I was on that meds that I, I, my, my mind was completely you know shut down, and that was okay. It was okay for me to learn to receive, and, and sometimes it's not all about giving. Sometimes it's okay to come to, you know, to be able to whatever it takes to get to the point. So even if you come and you're just going to receive, that's okay. And I think that, that mental health struggles, they're real, they're real. And, and it could be just as debilitating as somebody who had major surgery for something that's physical. And I think we need to, we need to, we as a whole need to be better at, at being compassionate and understanding and, um, but I, but I encourage you, I encourage you, Ashley, to just be be honest. Have a couple of, of, of women, actually, you know, Matt Carrier, so maybe four, you know, one to listen, one that can relate to you, one that will challenge you, and um, one that is, you know, just going to be do fun things, forget about that other stuff, you know. But that that's my, I was reading a devotional about that. But I think being being honest and, and where you're at and what your needs are and have have somebody you can go to that, you know, okay, I'm not going to feel judged if I share, but I need to be honest and get it out. Beautiful. All right, ladies, the last go around. Anyone else before we go ahead and close this one out? Uh, Linda, again. <laughs> well, if nobody else is going to say anything, I'll step in. So actually another thing that to share was even about receiving help. And I, I don't know anybody out there that doesn't have a hard time with, with asking for help and receiving help because we're all, we're self-sufficient. I can take care of myself and just humbling ourselves enough to say, you know what, I need help and asking for, it. and it's tough. And I think that's, I think got to put it out there because I, I I don't ask for help when I need help and sometimes I don't know that I need help when I need help so yeah just just a quick thought awesome we thank you for that thought all right guys we're gonna oh I see Susan <laughs> um well I haven't had a, a physical thing but I just wanted to share and I totally agree with what Linda just said that it's hard to receive help but I also just wanted to share that it was super encouraging to hear you sharing about what you went through and letting people give to you and um, just the impact it had on people even outside the church. 
um, like I was going to share about when Christy was going through everything she was going through. Um, I told my parents, because I know Christy, even though they're not disciples, they're not in the church. And my mom got this whole hula group together to, to pray. And now when I was just there, um, something came up about somebody having something that they needed prayer for. And my mom was all over. That really works. And that's what the Bible says that she's telling me. And I'm like, like her faith really grew from that experience of praying for Christy and seeing, seeing that, how all that that happened. So um, to even share with other people, other people did to, to bring them in to pray, even if they may not be part of the, our group, our church, you know, encourages them. So that's all. That's awesome. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Anyone else? Otherwise I'm going to start closing it down. So, again, beautiful. It's everything I expected. And I thank you so much. We so needed to hear from you. Thanks for being so open, so vulnerable. Um, it, it moved all of our hearts, but not just moved our hearts. It gives us something to all go back and go, okay, God, what are you speaking to me? Uh, my takeaway, besides Lucy saying, let us help you, BJ. Thank you, Lucy. But, <laughs> but my takeaway was, you know, we don't get to choose what we go through. That's God's decision. But I did love when Rosa said, but we have a choice as to how we go through it. And I think that is the thing. Sometimes we were so busy battling the fact that we were going through something and we're upset that we're going through something. And God is saying, that is not your decision. That's mine. That's right. But you do get a chance to choose how you go through it. So thank you for reminding me of Brother Hess. I do remember oh, that. Oh. You know, he decided. Yeah. Even though he knew he was dying, he decided we're going to do this on my terms. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there is that whatever we're going through, we get to choose how we go through it. So Rosa, thank you. Thank you for being a great example. And thank you for reminding us that God at least gives us a choice yeah. of going through this. So, all right, ladies, thank you for an hour of your life. And hopefully you've been motivated and inspired. So Rosa, thank you, sweetheart. You're so welcome. You're our power. <laughs> our power. Give my love to the Thank family. You. I will. It was lovely meeting everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone.